Hello, and welcome to our first virtual program in our conversation series. I am Marcia Ferranto, CEO of the National Law Enforcement Memorial and Museum. You are being joined by 750 other viewers in the room, which is rather remarkable and it reflects the importance of our topic today, facial recognition in law enforcement. Although our physical doors are temporarily closed, we remain laser focused on fulfilling our mission, honoring the fallen and telling the story about American law enforcement, educating the nation and connecting communities with law enforcement. But we don't do any of this alone. Without the help of individual supporters, like many of you in this virtual room and our corporate partners, we couldn't fulfill our mission and build on the importance of keeping the National Law Enforcement Memorial and Museum an essential and thriving organization. When the crisis is over, I encourage you to come to Washington DC and experience the only campus in our country which is dedicated to law enforcement. I would like to extend a heartfelt thank you to Target, who has so generously stepped up to sponsor today's program. Target's commitment to law enforcement is truly remarkable. And I thank you, Target. I have some housekeeping items for today. We have created a poll that we would like everyone to participate in the purpose of the poll is to get your initial opinion on facial recognition. All the attendees will be muted and you'll be able to submit your questions through the Q&A tab on the bottom of the screen. Be aware that everyone in the webinar will be able to see your question. You can vote up questions submitted by other attendees. Our panelists will prioritize answering the questions that receive the most votes. A link to our recording of this webinar will be sent to everyone next week and will also be available on the museum's YouTube channel. Panelists, I ask you to keep yourselves muted when you are not speaking. Without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Commissioner Bill Bratton as our keynote speaker. Commissioner Bratton is currently the Vice President to the Homeland Security Advisory Council, in addition to serving as the Executive Chairman of Teneo Risk. He previously served two terms as the New York City Police Commissioner, Commissioner of the Boston Police Department, and Chief of the Los Angeles Police Department. Everyone Please join me in welcoming Commissioner Bill Bratton. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it is a real pleasure to be here uh, presenting to what I understand of maybe almost 700 people who have signed up for this, and I would like to uh, welcome you. I'd like to thank the National Law Enforcement Museum, uh, certainly uh, the Police Foundation, and Target. Target I've worked with for many, many years in my former policing capacity. Thank you all for. Uh, this opportunity. I've been asked to keynote this very important discussion and I'll take five to seven minutes to introduce it from two perspectives. Uh, one, my law enforcement career, but also a significant part of the last 50 years of my life have also been spent in the private sector. And at the current time, uh, my private sector uh, assignment or position is with a company called Teneo, that advises CEOs on risk issues and risk issues involves very frequently technology, the appropriate use of technology. So in both the public and the private sector, the issue of facial recognition technology has been front and center for some time now. Uh, and the pace of attention focused on it has accelerated dramatically in 2019. And that continues into 2020. A new element that has, however, been added to the discussion and maybe we'll come into the discussion this morning with the panelists, is the pandemic, the coronavirus that we're dealing with. Because the new element I'm talking about is the idea that facial recognition, I believe, 
is going to become a key technology in helping to deal with the many issues that have been surfacing over these last several months. And by that, let me give you, by, uh, by way of example, let me give you two examples. Global entry at our ports of entry coming into the United States uh, involving Customs and Border Enforcement, as well as uh, at uh, TSA checkpoints at every one of the nation's airports and the new technology clear that had become very popular, both intended to expedite the verified entry of people into the airport or into the country. All of it relies very heavily on fingerprint analysis. And in the case of clear fingerprint and eye scanning capabilities, that is not going to be able to function uh, quite clearly as we begin to reopen uh, borders and begin to reopen our airports. I believe that facial recognition technology is going to be one of the technologies that will be used in its place and should be part of the panelists' discussion this morning, or at least thinking about that. Up to the point in time where uh, the coronavirus uh, became apparent in our country, late February, early March, I would describe what was going on in our country as the best of times, the worst of times. We take the opening line from The Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Best of times in that we were almost at full employment, the world of technology, which facial recognition is becoming a significant part of, was expanding dramatically, particularly in the private sector. It was being resisted fiercely in terms of uh, giving the public sector, particularly policing, access to that technology. And thus, that's, I believe, the uh, emphasis or the catalyst for today's discussion and debate. But the best of times in that law enforcement increasingly over the last 30 years, and I've been in the business 50 years, was benefiting dramatically from many advances, including camera surveillance, DNA testing, uh, even drone technology, which uh, like all of these technologies has good aspects and bad aspects. As it relates to law enforcement, and the discussion today is around the law enforcement component, that all of these technologies require policies and procedures within agencies, guiding their use by their personnel, they oftentimes, and of necessity, should require political or government oversight in terms of rules, regulations, laws, and protocols. And uh, uh, so today's discussion, I hope, will also focus on some of that uh, necessity. In any event, the timing of this discussion is very appropriate because what had been building up in 2018, 2019, is now going to accelerate in 2020 both in terms of how it might assist in dealing with coronavirus issues, but also the still, uh, I would describe it as raging debate from the civil liberties side, from the public sector law enforcement side, as to its appropriate usefulness. In closing my remarks, I'm going to uh, uh, make it quite clear that both from the private sector perspective and the public safety, criminal justice, law enforcement perspective, I am a strong advocate of its use. It is here, it is not going away, it is going to expand very dramatically in the private sector, or slowly, as so as often has been the case, whether it's with DNA, surveillance technology, artificial intelligence, use of algorithms, it tends to happen more slowly because of the regulation, law issues, and oversight issues in the public sector, and that's appropriate. But in the private sector, it is here, and you're going to see increasingly that uh, the corporate world uh, the government world that controls entry and access uh, to the country, to uh, various elements of the country, are going to embrace it, going to use it. So the timing of this discussion, uh, debate, if you will, is very appropriate because this needs to be informed. It needs to be informed by people who have different points of view, different perspective, uh, different understandings. So that as it goes forward, and it will go forward, we need to structure it in a way that we try to, as much as possible, find common ground so we can all find a place to voice our opinions and our concerns, have them considered. So as it does develop, either through private utilization or by government utilization, it is done in a way with significant transparency, significant oversight, and significant consideration for the privacy issues uh, that is so important to certainly some of the panelists on this discussion, but should be important to uh, 
all people, and particularly here in America, where we have so much focus on civil liberties and the importance of that in our form of democracy. So I thank, again, the, uh, the uh, Police Museum and the Police Foundation, uh, both of which have uh, been privileged to have a close association affiliation with Blog being given this opportunity to uh, hopefully be seen and heard. Hopefully the technology is working and uh, I'll be uh, able to uh, listen in as the panelists go at it. I'm going to have to drop off at some point in time for uh, another uh, conference, but I thank you again for this opportunity and this discussion on this extraordinarily important issue. All the best to all of you in these very interesting times that right now they might seem like the worst of times, but we've been there before and the best of times are ahead. Thank you, Commissioner Bratton. We are uh, very grateful for your time today and your participation. At this time, I'm excited to kick off our panel discussion and introduce to you our moderator, James Birch. Jim is the president of the National Police Foundation, overseeing the foundation's efforts to advance policing through innovations in practice and technology. Jim formerly served for more than 20 years at the U.S. Department of Justice. As Deputy Assistant Attorney General of the Office of Justice Programs, Jim served as the highest ranking civilian in DOJ's research and funding arm, overseeing all agency operations and management, interfacing with Congress and with cabinet level officials across DOJ and the federal government. We are honored to have Jim on our board of directors and here with us today. Please join me in welcoming our moderator, Jim Birch. Thanks so much, Marcia. It's great to uh, be with everybody here today. And although it looks like I'm at the law enforcement uh, museum, <laughs> I'm not at the law enforcement officers museum, uh, but I did want to give everybody an opportunity to see what the museum looks like. And I hope all of you when you're in Washington will take an opportunity to to stop by and visit this. That is where we were supposed to be today for this uh, conversation. Uh, it's great to be with everyone here. I'd like to just take a couple of minutes uh, to introduce our panelists to you. Um, I will remind you that their full bios are available on the event page so that you can read more about their backgrounds and perspectives and the work, great work that they've been doing. But I'd like to just uh, go through the list of names for you so that you know who is here in front of you today in this session. Um, first, we have uh, Secure Cook, who is Director of Justice Reform at the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights and the Leadership Conference Education Fund. Secure, welcome. Uh, we also have Steve Cook, who is retired as the Associate Deputy Attorney General at the U.S. Department of Justice, uh, where St Steve worked out of the Deputy Attorney General's office. Steve, thanks for being with us. Uh, Mr. Paul Fitzgerald, who is uh, currently Director of Security Services for the Edward Davis Company. Uh, Paul is also retired as a superintendent from the Boston Police Department. Uh, where he also served uh, during the uh, Boston Marathon bombing event. He was chief of the Bureau of Intelligence and Analysis. So Paul brings great perspective. Paul, thank you for being here as well. Uh, Professor Barry Friedman, uh, a, a great addition to this panel and a great friend, uh, is faculty director uh, and the Jacob D. Fuchsberg Professor of Law uh, uh, and the Policing Project at New York University, NYU School of Law. Uh, Dr. Jonathan Phillips uh, is an electronic engineer from the National Institute of Standards and Technology, otherwise known as NIST, um, and the Information Technology Laboratory there. Welcome, doctor. And then last, uh, another great friend, Jay Stanley, uh, senior policy analyst at the American Civil Liberties uh, Union, and he's always willing to join these uh, events and these dialogues. So, Jay, we thank you for, for that. Um, so, I think I've, I've uh, managed to uh, get all of our speakers in. Uh, let me just take one minute before I jump into the substance here um, in the spirit of transparency, since that will be a topic we're talking about. Um, I would like to say that as a moderator, I am neutral and independent uh, as I come to this, but I can't say that. We have uh, the Police Foundation, the National Police Foundation has taken a position on some of these issues previously. And we've, uh, our position has been that uh, the banning the use of the technology outright is, is not a good idea. 
Uh, instead, that we should focus on accountability and transparency in its use, as well as strong governance and policy. Um, you can find that on our website. Uh, we've also been critical of the way in which uh, at least one agency, not necessarily in this country, but abroad, uh, has used the technology, um, be not because we thought it was, was wrong, but the way that it was done, the timing of it uh, probably could have been better. But again, those are our positions, and I wanted to disclose that to you. Uh, and you also know from Marsha's introductory comments that we have an association with the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial Fund. So the way we're planning to begin this conversation today is to first start off by setting some baseline. I'd like for us to understand a little bit about this technology, the algorithms that support facial recognition technologies, so that we're all operating off of the same understanding about what that technology looks like, how it functions, where its strengths are and what its weaknesses are. And then we can dive into some of the use cases, the potential opportunities, as well as the risks that are associated with the technology. So Jonathan, I'm gonna direct the first question to you um, so that you can help us understand from NIST's perspective uh, what we know about this technology. So let me, let me ask you, so you're, you're a scientist at um, you know, the United States government, National Institute of Standards and Technology. NIST has been studying facial recognition uh, capabilities and accuracies since about 2000, as best I can tell, and has continued this research across multiple uh, presidential administrations, nearly 20 years of research and testing in very controlled uh, test environments. In your tests, including a recent test on demographic differentials, you studied nearly 190 different facial recognition algorithms from approximately 100 different companies and tested each using a database of over 18 million images of over 8 million men and women from seven global regions and 24 countries around the world. What were the results of those tests? So thank you for that very nice introduction and question, Jim. Um, I'll just go back and give a bit more is that I've actually been involved as a government employee in face recognition since 1993. And the one of the things we've done is systematically over the, this period of time measure their accuracy starting from when it was, when it was um, just coming out of the laboratories and universities all the way up. And, and, I was, and the demographic report which came out in December um, was the person in charge of that led that effort was um, Patrick Rother. And one of the things we looked at was the, let me put the limitations or that the scope of that report is they were primarily dealing with um, or mug shots, images taking controlled entry. I will focus more on the mug shots because that actually had the demographic metadata and the results that came out. There were two key things we do application. One is verification. For example, if I go to take my money out of a, an ATM and they say, I'm Jonathan Phillips, you would like to say yes. If I, somebody else, if I say, I'm, I'm somebody else, you would like the system to re, to say, let me, to say that's not Jonathan. And that was one scenario that was tested. Another one that was tested was um, doing searches, large databases. So somebody takes a picture of me and runs them against, say, a data set of 1.6 million, 12 million, you would like the the chance that I would come out as the top match. What we found is, and this is echoes all the things we've done, is that we tested that, tested all these algorithms. We found a large range of performance and a large range of these demographic differentials, from some being very high to others being, being all over the range. And we found differences in the amount of demographic differentials between the verification case and the large scale search case. I would emphasize that this report was restricted in this case for say mug shots. It did not address the unconstrained situation, which is more, which is, would be a more correct model for surveillance. But one of the lessons that sort of cut, cut, would come out is that, is that you have a range of performance and you really need to sit, ask yourself if for any application, it's there, is important and you need to look at it. But you also need to measure it for your application using your set of algorithms and using on your data to get a more accurate, to get an accurate assessment, how it actually the demographics would affect your, your application and the technology would impact that. And there may be differences between algorithms, between data sets. So just to follow up on that, just to, to be clear in all of the research that you've done, have you found any 
facial recognition capability, whether it's available for government use or only for private use, that doesn't have any potential for false positives or false negatives? So if you're asking if you have potential for false positive and false negatives, if you want to get those to zero, you'd have to have a, you'd have a perfect system. And we've yet to see a perfect system. So it doesn't exist. Oh, sorry, I mean, Morgan, we have never, te- we have never found one in testing that exists that is, that is perfect. When you and I spoke the other day, we, talk a, we talked a little bit about image quality, and I think you just referenced it a little bit as well, but could you talk a little bit about how image quality impacts the effectiveness of these algorithms? So you could have the, you could have the best algorithm out there that really minimizes the opportunity for false positives and false negatives, but if the image quality isn't sufficient, it, it creates a larger issue. Is that right? Yes. So let me clarify what image quality. Usually our, our notion of a high quality image is one that's taken in a studio lighting and is even and looks high quality. But when you get out, when you vary from, we found some studies where we vary, we vary location of where images were taken, the location itself can affect the quality itself. And this becomes more important as the quality as you move from, say, matching mug shots to mug shots, which even there can vary by location, to if you start going to more uncontrolled, uncontrolled images, in some cases where the image is taken has a larger effect on performance than almost a large number of other factors. And, and given that, that there are these issues, right, and, and that image quality can impact uh, the performance of these algorithms, are there things that NIST does to recommend to government agencies for the sort of a best practice for how to mitigate some of those risks in terms of how it's implemented or how it's used? Is that, does anybody help these agencies with that? So we're willing to have conversations about, we, we limit ourselves during the formal testing to what we call technology, where the algorithm comes to us to be tested. But we do provide this where we can talk to people and based on experience, we can say what factors and set and how to do tests. And I should say, these are only advisory factors. We can give advice to, um, to people who make decisions and give numbers of what needs to be done next. So then what I take away from this is that you all have done a lot of work to study the performance of these tools, but that an agency could easily end up procuring and using a tool that was pretty far down on the list in terms of performance, right? In terms of producing false positives or, or allowing false negatives, if they're not careful. Um, the, because you talked about how the performance varies across the wide continuum, right? So one thing we do is, is we've done, and this has been doing, I guess the first big test and evaluation we did was in 2002, is we have tests, they are open up, they're open to both academia and industry and other research labs. And one of the rules is if we run them, we publish results with all their names by them. So we do inf- make available, and these are published on our website. I see on the chat the link to, I assuming that is would be the, um, um, it's more like the um, d- d- demographic differential report. We make these available with all the, all those who submitted, how they did, and we put names next to their performance curves. Or the performance numbers. So this is available to the available to the world. You can go to the NIST website and download them and use them for advice or not advice for information about what's the range of performance, which ones are doing well in our tests, which doesn't necessarily mean that they will absolutely do well on your on your application, but the information is there for people to understand what's the range of performance and where they stand. That's great. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Jonathan. I think one of the other things I took away from our conversation the other day was, um, and I've seen this in other places as well, that the technology has advanced tremendously, you know, particularly in recent years. And is it your perspective, I don't know if it's fair to say, is it your perspective that at some point this techno- the technology will advance to a point where it solves this problem of false negatives, or do we always need to have a human involved in the decision-making process? Is that the safest way? So there are are two parts of the question. So let me address the the first one. So one thing we've done is we've been um, started out, we call mobile studios, then mugshot type images. And I won't go into the details, but from 
the last time we looked at it was from starting in 1993, 25 year, years later to 2018. Every two years, the error rate in this type of images has got is, is reduced by one half. And this is one case, and we don't, which shows it going on. At some point, we may reach the limit. The other question was, for a lot of jobs, right, for a lot of cases right now, is um, you, you have human adjudicators, other people looking at it. One other thing we've been doing is comparing algorithm performance to machine performance. And one of the latest results we came out with almost two years ago was there are people out there called facial forensics examiners. These are people who are trained in how to compare faces and they are prepared to testify in court. And we had a question we asked them is, are these two images the same? And what we found out is that then we did this, we also tested one of the latest alg an algorithm from 2018. We found that the best algorithm on this problem was comparable to the best humans. So this is showing that, that algorithm performance of the best humans have a narrow on these, on these set of images were the same. We also did something else where we fused the two together and that produced the, both the fused or combined the two decisions together and this produced the best overall accuracy we've seen. Thank you. And the last question for you on this, if you could, and the link that we sent out was the link to the demographic report that NIST prepared. Could you talk a little bit about the differential impacts that you observed in your testing, particularly as it relates to different ethnicities and races, but also gender and age groupings? So, so the, the different answer ones, and I'm going to go over the, um, the, the race versus gender. And this is going to be for, and we found the biggest differential, at least for the false positives as a rule is between Caucasian men and African-American females. I found out that both those factors affected, affected, and we've seen differences between another test between gender and age over time. So this suggests that for applications as algorithms change, you need to continue testing for the effect of these, we, these factors, our demographics on differential performance and their impact on them. Right. Thank you, Jonathan. So what I'd like to do now is to, to sort of transition the conversation to, I think, another important baseline consideration, which is how widely is this used, right? I think this was a question that I had for a long time until I began talking to uh, agency leaders around the country, and I started to hear some some responses that were different than what I thought was actually occurring, because I, I really believe that this was a much more common uh, technology for use. And so I want to talk a little bit about that, and I'm going to direct the first question to Paul. Um, but let me give you a little bit of background, Paul. So in 2016, um, the Center on Privacy and Technology at Georgetown Law uh, re released a, um, a report uh, that talked about and disclosed significant federal capabilities. So these are federal agencies, FBI, DHS, for example, significant capability to use uh, facial recognition technologies and broad authority uh, on behalf of many states and localities to access um, similar capabilities in multiple states. So in other words, they allow others to access their data uh, for purposes of facial recognition. So this points out just... Um, you know, I think the report really pointed out for, for many how many of us and our photos are involved uh, in these databases and uh, that they can be searched or used uh, by these technologies, um, despite the weaknesses of some of those uh, technologies. And I, I think we all have to acknowledge that that's pretty frightening to a lot of people. I'm sure Jay and others will talk about that here shortly. But in, as I read the methodology of the Georgetown report, um, what they indicated was that they sent open records requests, a very specific request to about 106 agencies. And it appeared that in response to those open records requests, that just under half provided documentation indicating that they were currently using, planning to use, uh, or had acquired the technology. At the same time, roughly about roughly 30 of those responding agencies indicated that they were not using the technology or were no longer using the technology. Um, and of course, there were many that just didn't respond uh, to the request. So the records request was pretty broad. Um, it talked about uh, an agency's in-house use, of face, in -house use uh, of facial recognition technology, but also their ability to access facial recognition through other jurisdictions. Um, so it was a pretty broad request. Um, 
uh, around how they're using facial, uh, facial recognition technology. Um, not a lot of agencies reporting current use. The report also includes the following statement that I think is important to note. The benefits of facial recognition are real. It has been used to catch violent criminals and fugitives. The law enforcement officers who use the technology are men and women of good faith. They do not want to invade our privacy or create a police state. They're simply using every tool available to protect the people that they are sworn to serve. Police use of facial recognition is inevitable. This report does not aim to stop it. So I know it's a bit unfair to take that statement out of context of the Georgetown report, but I think it's important as we try to understand how widely used these capabilities are to see that perspective from this report. So Paul, I want to start out with you. Any agencies are uh, planning to or sort of running down the track to implement their own internal facial recognition capabilities? There are certainly some obviously, but what's your take on this and what's your experience in, in Boston PD as relates to how common this need is and why? Okay, Jim, thanks for having me. Uh, you know, I'll start, I'll start off with uh, the way you kind of finished that Georgetown report, that most police departments are all in this for the right reasons. We're all here to, to serve the community and to do it the right way. And I know this conversation is really going to strike on the, the needed balance between the two. We have communities that we owe it to them to use the best available technologies that we can to keep them safe. Clear, that's a, a, a very responsible thing that we take, take seriously. At the same time, it's about creating strong policies if we're gonna use it and uh, always having human oversight you know, if that is uh, a direction we're going to go in, we write a, I think I would recommend that we collaborate with community members when we're writing strong policy, give them some input. Uh, and all policies should have strong human oversight to overcome any questions about the accuracy and of the technologies and standards of training should be set at the highest level for every department that's going to use it. Uses, I would go back to my experiences seven years ago at the marathon. Um, you have a situation there, and I have firsthand ex uh, experience because I was on the route. I worked with the FBI throughout the week on the investigative side of it. And I can tell you the explosions happened on a Monday afternoon. We had video, very clear video of the Zanaev brothers Tuesday by dinner time. And from Tuesday at dinner time to Thursday when we released the pictures to the public, we were not able to identify them. Uh, we, would, we would painstakingly going over by the video, looking at phone, cell phones that we used, making calls, trying to track the exact time. And there were hundreds of thousands of calls being made at that time. And we weren't able to track them down. Now, had we had good use of facial recognition, um, I think it would, have, you know, it would have been solved in a much more timely manner. And as we've learned, after uh, the outcome of uh, the pictures being released and, and they then went and killed a MIT police officer and the, we had the very violent shootout in Watertown. Uh, I think had we identified them earlier, we would have been able to take them down in a, in a manner of our choosing and uh, done it you know, in a much safer capacity and, and kept a lot of people out of harm's way. So I think uh, there's a, a tremendous need for it. You know, there's obviously different uses for it, static and uh, live, and, and we can get into all those different uses, but uh, I think we owe it to our communities. I also uh, oversaw the Fusion Center, uh, the Boston Regional Intelligence Center, and it was a Fusion Center, and, and that's another area of controversy around the country. There's a lot of suspicion when it comes to Fusion Centers that we're spying on people. Uh, so I learned very very um, early on that it's important to be transparent and to sit and talk things out, don't jump into them, and then start with a, a well-written policy. Let the public know, be very open about what you're doing, what you, how your uses are gonna be, and then, um, and then you have to adhere to the policy and, and give the community updates. But community is, the trust is critical to major city policing and I can, un, unfortunately, I would tell you that Boston is not use a lot, utilizing a lot of 
great potential, a lot of great technologies, because we don't want to um, take that trust. We don't want to ruin our trust with our community. So we're not using, we, we built a real-time crime center. We wanted to use drones. We wanted to use license plate readers, um, GPS bracelets, like really pull all that technology together to help our officers make good decisions in the field. But we held off uh, because we didn't want to take any risk to the important uh, trust with the community in Boston. So I can tell you that, that um, I think we could do a lot more, but we put trust at, at the top, which, you know, arguably should be. So, yeah. Thanks, Paul. And, and it's interesting to note too, as we were planning this, uh, this discussion and thinking about, you know, who could we get to come on from an agency to talk about their experience using this tool? Uh, the biggest problem we had was uh, finding agencies that, that were, were, were using it or were that, that wanted to acknowledge using it. Jay, I, I want to switch up and go to you. One of the things that I think we have to, to sort of keep in this conversation is the extent to which this technology is being used in the private sector. How do you see that? I know you all have got some concerns about the expansive use of this. Yeah, I mean, I think the issues are, are much different for the private sector in some ways. Um, although in other ways, they're the same. Um, transparency, um, questions about the accuracy of the technology, the, the racially differential um, accuracy of the technology, um, and exactly how this plays forward um, and what the public role is in oversight. Um, I think that all of the problems that can happen on the law enforcement side can also happen on the, the, the private sector side. Um, we did an um, experiment where we went and took the top 20 retailers uh, in America and we asked them all a simple question. Are you using face recognition on your customers? And with only two exceptions, one company that said no and one company that said yes, none of them would even answer us and tell us <laughs> if they were using face recognition on a technology on their customers. Um, face recognition, my understanding is from what we can tell because there's so little transparency is that insofar it is being used in retail, um, it's being used uh, for loss prevention for um, people who've been trespassed, um, identifying uh, people like that. Um, and, and, and you, you know, Face recognition does no good as a security matter unless you have a blacklist um, or a, a watch list um, of people that you're looking for. How are those watch lists constructed? Who's put on there? Who has the power to put on there? If I go to a, if I go to a retail store and the clerk is super rude to me and I talk back, is he going to stick me on one of these lists? Um, uh, certainly there is, an, unfortunately, in the 20th century, a long history of um, companies creating blacklists during the labor movement, uh, the early 20th century especially, companies creating blacklists of quote unquote troublemakers, which usually meant labor organizers who were agitating for you know, radical measures like the five day work week um, and, uh, and, and, and putting them on blacklists, sharing them around among companies so that those people couldn't find a job in any company in town. Um, so uh, you know, we have due process concerns, um, transparency concerns, fairness concerns, and accuracy concerns over the technology itself, and, um, and ultimately concerns about where this is all going. Um, do we want to be recognized by every camera that, that into whose field of view we walk um, with our, um, the time and place, our identity, and who we're with all notated in some database? And, and Secure, you and I have talked a little bit too about some of your concerns the, of seeing this technology begin to be used in a, a broader government applications. I think there was even a, a recent case around public housing access that uh, was a problem as well. Can you talk about that for a second? Yeah, thank you. As Jay mentioned, the leadership conference has um, raised in conjunction with ACLU in many cases, concerns around the accuracy, the transparency, um, lack of transparency, lack of, you know, sort of oversight and accountability about the, the use of these technologies. And more, most recently, we saw um, a case in New York City where a um, housing authority was considering using the technology as part of um, its mechanism for allowing people entry into their apartment, right, um, to try to save money on 
lost keys and replacing door locks and things like that. And, and so on its face, it seems like it could be a, um, you know, an efficient use and something that would be beneficial to a person who, um, you know, lived in a building. But there were a lot of questions um, with respect to notice, right? They didn't provide ad adequate notice to tenants. Um, there wasn't a meaningful conversation with tenants about um, the adoption of the technology and what the implications for that would be, um, what the, the privacy concerns and who would have access to the data sets, who would have access to, how would they protect against, you know, un unauthorized access to the data sets. So there were a host of things that hadn't been considered, that there was no, as Jay mentioned, no real communication and conversation with the tenants. Um, and so there was a lot of pushback and a lot of blowback around, around that and mandating its use um, for people in this, this uh, apartment was really problematic. And so I think we, what we've seen, and, and I think this is borne out in what almost everyone has said, is that one, people are unwilling to um, say in most cases whether or not so we actually don't know um how how widespread its use is um and in to the extent that they are using them there aren't really rules for the road and accuracy for us is huge i mean misidentifications of darker skinned people of african americans asian americans and others is a huge problem and and until there is you know sort of a level of accuracy that is almost perfect quite frankly, um, we would continue to raise alarm bells um, and call for, um, uh, you know, people taking a step back and having um, a real conversation around the implications for surveillance, a real conversation around the implications for trust. I think what Paul said is, is a really important point around maintaining trust in communities, especially communities of color, where there is a lack of trust between law enforcement in those communities in a lot of instances um, because of historical um, issues um, with between police and, and some communities. And so, I think that you know, as we think about where the use, is, where it's happening, and massive transparency around who's using it, and why, and, and for what purpose, who has access to those databases, who has access to those data sets. As we think about transparency, there are just too many questions for us um, to say that we feel comfortable that this won't have an unintended consequence, even if there are, you know, um, even if there, it's possible that this could be used in a way. That um, that would help, right? Law enforcement to um, identify, you know, someone in the case of of the bomber, as Paul pulled out. You know, even if that scenario is true, if all of these other things are not addressed, if all these other things are not fixed, you know, I don't. Think you will instill the confidence of the community of 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 everyone that it is okay and it is right to use this type of technology, this type of surveillance. And I think, you know, later in our conversation, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that Barry will talk a little bit about his ideas around cost benefit, right? Is it, is it worth it? If it's going to help us in this one case, is it worth it in all the other places where it may not help us, right? It may actually take us back. And so I think we have to have those conversations. Is, uh, is Steve back on? Steve Cook, are you, are you back with us? I was talking about your role at DOJ in the Deputy Attorney General's office, giving you a perspective into what the federal agencies are doing, but also into what state and local law enforcement is doing around the country. And I'd, I'd love to just have you talk about how prevalent do you think this is? And is this something that you ran into a lot in your role at DOJ? Well, thanks for asking. The, first of all, my role at DOJ was in the Deputy Attorney General's Office. I was the Director of, of Law Enforcement Affairs and, and uh, both there and subsequent to that, I've had, had the privilege of working with uh, law enforcement folks from across the country, and um, and part of that has touched on uh, the use of facial recognition. One of the things that I have noticed uh, that I think is extremely important is the misconception, the gross misconception about how facial recognition is used by law enforcement. Uh, a lot of people, I think, have this idea that that, that law enforcement puts a, a, a photograph into the system and that uh, it, it then instantly uh, it spits out the one and only suspect and police run out and make an arrest. And that's, that's what's driving, I think, a lot of the, 
uh, concern. That misconception is a gross misconception because the way there are two ways, of course, that uh, facial recognition is used. One is a one-to-one -one, uh, use where you have a known picture of somebody and then they present themselves and you just simply verify that was, I think, I think, I think it was uh, Dr. Phillips uh, mentioned that. The other way, though, the one that's most commonly used in law enforcement is what's called a one-to-many, and that is an identification process. So you have a picture of a suspect. You put, this, put, put that, 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 if you will, it's a probe. You put that probe into the system, and it generates a list of suspects. Now, that's an incredibly valuable tool for law enforcement. It's much better than, than, than and it's a much more accurate way than what we have done historically. Historically, if we had a crime, we had a picture of a suspect, we might, if we were lucky, get that out in the media and we would get calls from anonymous calls from neighbors, from, from, uh, from people who say, said that may be my gardener. We would get calls from psychics, a wide range of, of, of often unreliable sources. In this case, though, with, with this technology, it lists, it gives you a list of, of suspects and with a 99.7% uh, reliability rate, that suspect list uh, is valuable to law enforcement. You can go out and then use that only as a starting point and then build your case around it. You know, find eyewitness, eyewitnesses who can say, yes, this is the individual who did it. Determine where that individual was at the at the time, determine whether this person has a criminal history of, of a sort that would suggest that, that, that they did it and I could go on. But it's an incredibly valuable tool in that context. We've solved murders, we've solved robberies, we've, we've uh, recovered abducted uh, uh, children who've been put in, this, in, in, the, in the sex trafficking. Uh, and I could go on with, the, uh, w with a long list of very uh, heinous crimes that have been solved uh, because we have this technology. And so while I recognize there are first and fourth amendment concerns and, and otherwise, I think we have to be very careful about the limitations that we put on law enforcement because um, as, as, as you have recognized, as Commissioner Bratton pointed out and, 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 uh, and others, the, the, uh, the, and, and Mr. Fitzgerald, I think, law enforcement people are in this occupation to serve the public in, in good faith, not to uh, uh, trample their rights. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate that uh, perspective. Um, and it, and it, as I hear you talk about that one to many with human intervention, I think that kind of ties back to what uh, Dr. Phillips was saying about sort of the best, the best possibility is to use the technology in conjunction with human review. Right? And I don't think there's anybody that's suggesting that we would use or anyone would use the technology without some human intervention, right? At some point, there has to be human intervention. Um, I want to kind of draw in Jay or uh, Barry on that. Do you have any concerns with anything we've just said, or do you see it differently? Well, we, the ACLU, we have called for a moratorium on the tech, use of the technology by government law enforcement. Um, and the, you know, there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, there are, there, there's not enough transparency in how a lot of agencies are using it, um, as you discussed earlier, Jim. Um, uh, you know, Georgetown and others have had to do um, open records requests, FOIA's requests. It's been like pulling teeth to get information about how a lot of agencies are using it. So we need more transparency. There's so many uncertainties about the technology itself, as the NIST report indicates. I asked Patrick Grother who worked with Dr. Phillips on the report. And um, I said, so there are these um, demographic differentials. Are they because people, um, because the training data sets in the AI have been tilted towards light skinned people, or does it have something to do with the physics of light and the way the physics reflects off white faces and, and darker faces? And he said, we don't know. And that was just stunning to me that, so, that such a basic question was still unknown about this technology. Um, and, and then, you know, also for, you know, we heard Paul talk about, you know, being uh, transparent and, and having trust with the community and so forth. And I think that most of the smarter law enforcement um, people recognize that, but there's a lot of law enforcement agencies in this country. There's a bell curve inevitably. And, you know, for all the talk of sort of ideal ways that this is used, and ideal deployments, um, we're seeing a lot of very sloppy uses out there. Um, just to pick one example from the, um, the Georgetown report, uh, in New York City, 
there was a uh, a crime and the, the, they had a photo, not a very good one, I understand, and they used f face recognition to come up with a list of suspects and a detective sent the top hit to a witness with the message, is this the guy? Anybody who knows anything about um, the malleability of human memory and, the, and, and witness identification understands just how uh, prone to create injustices that kind of a thing would be. Um, and then finally, you know, unfortunately, our criminal justice system has not proven very good at sifting out good science from bad. Um, there was a devastating National Academies of Science report on forensic science that found that um, there have been an enormous number of um, injustices because the courts have accepted things like, um, you know, bite marks analysis and, and hair analysis and, and many other sort of forensic technologies which are accepted by the, by the courts that do not have sci strong scientific bases. And there was a man in Texas who was uh, prosecuted for a fire that killed his three daughters um, based on this sort of fire science that didn't have strong um, scientific boundaries. And he was actually executed for that crime. Um, and it's pretty clear now that that was based on bogus science. Um, so that is the context into which face recognition technology is landing. Um, and so we need, to, we need to have a democratic discussion. We need to, first of all, we need more transparency. We need um, input from affected communities. And we need to have a democratic discussion uh, about what kind of um, uses of this technology we want to allow because it does change the balance between the government and the governed. And it's, it's, it's a, a potential sort of nuclear bomb for privacy. Um, uh, and it's something that the human species has never before experienced this kind of ability. I want to just ask Paul, in your previous role at the Fusion Center or elsewhere in BPD, did you, did you feel like there were adequate rules and protections in place? I mean, I guess that's sort of an odd question to ask you from, from your role, but I mean, you probably felt like there were a lot of things you had to comply with, right? Yeah, I, definitely. I mean, we, we tried to be very uh, transparent and we constantly had advocacy groups uh, foyering for information. So we, we knew, you know, whatever we do is going to come out in the public view. So we, we lived the right way. And and again, I can't tell you how many discussions we had inside the BRIC, the Fusion Center, on doing things the right way. You know, I think if people ever saw that and knew how hard we worked at it, they would have been quite proud of us. And um, I gotta say, I, I agree with Jay. You know, everything he has said in Secura, you know, I would say I agree with. I think balance is is the key. You know, you need you need to be transparent and you need to take privacy and trust put that at the top of the list and, and go at it from that point. But I, but I also agree, I think it was Steve who talked about how many of the articles uh, that I've read on this point to DNA and fingerprinting as, as the similarities and, and that, this, you know, that um, this is not being done the way they were. But again, this is just um, one piece. It's, it's a, a piece to give you reasonable suspicion to talk to someone. It's not going to put someone in jail. Uh, and it's always going to have a human uh, person who's highly trained making the final decision on it. So it's going to put a, some suspects together on a list and then you corroborate things. And if they don't work out, those people drop off the list and, and you try to narrow it down. But I just want to make it clear, this doesn't put people in jail. This is a piece, uh, a lead. It's a lead for an investigator. Secure, can you respond to that? How, how, does, how does that address the risk that we have of misidentification, particularly with regard to minorities and others that would be subject to this? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I hear what Paul is saying and Steve are saying about, you know, this is adding to a list of suspects. But if I am misidentified and put on that list, and then I'm questioned and, um, you know, there's the potential for, you um, a improper interaction with with uh, law enforcement that could could result in something different. And, and listen, I would like to think that our system works so perfectly that people are never falsely accused and or falsely convicted and mm -hmm. incarcerated. But we know that that is not the case, right? And so there is the because of that, you know, you have to be hypersensitive and and hyper. Um, um, 
you have to be hypersensitive to um, real concerns around accuracy, real concerns around transparency. And, you know, if I am, you know, misidentified and placed on a list, and then if, because I have a, a history, because I have a, a, a background that might make me more, um, you know, uh, uh, curious or make me, uh, uh, make the person feel that I am more likely to have been involved in, in this activity, that could have a, a, a impact on my civil liberties, on my freedom in some negative, in, in negative way. Um, and so, you know, what we often say is sort of um, a crude way of talking about how algorithmic bias and data, um, if it's not the most accurate data, it will not lead to the most accurate results. And there could be um, a problem on the outside. So if there's garbage in, you know, so you sort of get garbage out. Um, and that's how algorithms work. And if you don't have the proper data sets to protect against that, and the algorithm is trained on data, a data set, and that, those data sets are limited, you are limited in the type of accuracy and um, in your results. And so I don't, I'm not willing to, and I think, you know, as Jay said, that like, the leadership conference has also taken this position of a moratorium. We're not willing to um, say that it is okay, um, even in the world of putting one person on a list of a whole bunch of other people in order to narrow, that that's even okay without all of the other concerns with respect to accuracy, accountability, uh, transparency with the community, um, real, you know, sort of um, a real interrogation and investigation of its overall use of, and how people are using it to say that that would even be okay, right? Because there is this possibility for someone to be falsely accused, falsely incarcerated, falsely convicted. And we know that that happens in our society. Our, our system is not perfect. And because of that, because of the inherent bias that exists, we have to be, um, we have to overcompensate in other ways. And I think really be attuned to, to limiting uh, as much as possible um, any unintended consequences on the back end. Yeah, uh, thank you for that. And and Dr. Phillips, you should correct me if I've got this wrong, but I think that you know, my, my own perspective on this is that we should all be concerned about these false positives. Um, I am encouraged by the fact that we hear from practitioners that the way that it's used, that there would always be some human intervention. But the place that I'm just as concerned, I think, is on the, on the side of false negatives, which we wouldn't know about. Um, we wouldn't have the opportunity to necessarily intervene. So if the system tells us there's no match, but there really is, we have no way to really intervene from a human side to be able to correct that. Um, Dr. J uh, Phillips, if I got that wrong, please let me know. But that, that was my understanding of, of, of some of the testing. Um, what, I'd, what I'd like to do at this point is transition a little bit. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, something that uh, our friend Barry Friedman here at NYU Policing Project um, wrote an op-ed in the New York Times. And I understand we're going to share with you the link to the op-ed if you have not seen that. Um, but I found it really interesting. I found it interesting in so many ways because he talks about how there's pretty much everything wrong with the way in which this technology is being deployed. But at the same time, the title of the op-ed is A Way Forward. And he talks about the ability for limited use um, and that law enforcement should be able to use facial recognition. So it's a very interesting perspective. So Barry, if you I apologize for keeping you waiting this long, but if you could jump in and tell us, share your thoughts on this and let's have a conversation about it. Sure, Jim, it's good to be here, uh, to see all the panelists and know that there's so many other people listening. So the Policing Project, the organization that I run, and I'm gonna post a link to our page on technology. We take a position toward these technologies that uh, we think is a bit of the middle of the road, but also the same one I like to think, though there's been lots of sanity expressed on the panel so far, which is that we need to think about uh, the costs and benefits of these technologies. We need to figure out how to get the benefits out of them in a way that mitigates the harms, minimizes the harms, or hopefully eliminates all the harms. Harms about constitutional rights, harms about privacy, racial justice, overcriminalization, all the things that we ought to worry about anytime you roll out a new technology like this. Uh, and at the Policing Project, we have sort of a two-step way of thinking about things. First, and I think this is important because it echoes some of the things Paul and Sakira and Jay have said, which is, 
Uh, we think there has to be democratic accountability no matter what. People have said transparency, but transparency is only a first step. You actually need sign off democratically with guardrails as to how something's going to be used. And then you ought to engage in cost benefit analysis and figure out what are the use cases. So in my op-ed that I wrote with Andrew Ferguson, who's a professor at American University and a friend of mine and a fellow at the Policing Project, we looked at three, uh, I, I guess actually we only look at two, but I'm gonna give you three different kinds of use cases because I think this is the way to frame the conversation. There's face verification, face matching, and face surveillance. So face verification is probably the easiest of them all. This is the one where somebody's moving across a border and there's a passport and there's an image and the question is, is this the person that's in that passport? Is it the same person? Or is it the same person that we've biometrically recorded? And these kinds of records are kept crossing most borders and uh, there's no data that's retained. It's a one-to-one -one match. And so that's your easiest case. On your hardest case, and in fact, the one where I, I think we ought not to go there is face surveillance. So face surveillance is you've got CCT camera, CCTV cameras up everywhere all over a city and you're running the algorithm and you have the capacity to trace somebody's movements either in real time or frankly retrospectively which is that you've got recordings of all these cameras and you can figure out where somebody has been the sort of thing we also do with license plate readers and i think when it comes to facial recognition we ought to just rule that off the table and even though you can give me you know horrific cases where we'd want to be able to trace somebody's movements the boston bomber is one the minute we create that infrastructure, it's out there and it's available, and I am not at all confident about the safeguards to use it. The intermediate case is face matching, and that is what most agencies in the United States that are trying facial recognition are, try, are, are doing. And face matching is, we've got an image of somebody committing a crime. And by the way, it doesn't have to be the horrible crimes that get trotted out. I get a little frustrated when all we ever hear about is the horrible crimes, because in reality, law enforcement's gonna use this for the usual crimes. And I'll say a word about that in just a moment. But we've got an image of somebody, you know, maybe they're mugging people on a subway station or whatnot. We don't know who it is. And so face matching says we then run that, that photo through a database, and we need to talk about what that database is. That's complicated all by itself. And we figure out who are our suspects, and then we go through some human in the loop process of figuring out who are, the, who are the right people or who is the right person to think has committed this offense. And I think that that use of facial recognition is acceptable with some very strict guardrails. And I'll just mention a couple, but we could talk about more. Uh, the first is, beside democratic accountability and legitimacy, the, the first is that I think we only ought to use it for serious crimes. What's happened with too many technologies and too much of law enforcement in this country is that we start out saying we're going to go after stolen cars, we're going to go after homicide, and it ends up being, you know, low-level drug uh, sales and whatnot. And, uh, uh, you know, suspending licenses for unpaid traffic tickets and then finding people with facial recognition. That doesn't make any sense. So it's got to be serious offenses. Uh, it probably makes sense to have some sort of a warrant process or approval process to make sure that we're only using it for those kinds of offenses and with the right guardrails. And then uh, we do need this accuracy in terms of race and demographics because even if there's a human in the loop, the fact of the matter is people are going to become criminal justice system involved if we don't have some system of making sure that we're going after the right folks uh, and that there's that kind of accuracy with the system. And finally, there's this really, really, really hard question about what's your target database. So, you know, I've looked at some of the questions coming in, in the Q&A and people are asking, is it mugshots? Is it scraping social media? Is it DMV records? And you know, here I'm gonna admit that my perspective is a little idiosyncratic, though I'm prepared to defend it vigorously, uh, which is you know, a lot of people say, don't worry, we're just using mugshot databases. But I think that's exactly wrong. These mugshot databases have been created through a long history of policing that has not always been racially just. And if you want facial recognition to work, if you want to find the person in the image, you ought to, ought to have the broadest possible database that you can. And so I think, if we're gonna buy into facial recognition, put us all in. You know, you use DMV records or you use some global database. If you are not willing to be in the database, then don't put other people in the database. I could go on, but I, but I will stop. So I, I wanna to go to Steve first. Steve, can you, can you respond to that a little bit? Um, being the prosecutor in the group with us here, let's hear your perspective. Well, with respect to the last point, I couldn't agree more. The wider the database, the better for law enforcement and the fairer it is across the board. The, the one other thing point I want, want to touch on quickly is this 
red herring about uh, about disparities in certain groups because I think um, in, in my in my impression of this is based on Dr. Phillips' colleague who testified who has actually testified in multiple congressional hearings, but most recently testified January 15th to uh, January 15th of this year to the fact that those uh, that, that the uh, al the best algorithms uh, now have a very minimal disparity. In fact, I think pretty much statistically insignificant. But as you point out, you have a human intervention uh, regardless. Going back to the database, let me give you an example. And, and, and just to quibble a little bit, low-level drug traffickers are not, are not insignificant offenders. If you're selling drugs to my kids, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a serious offense. That, that aside, uh, the database, let me give you an example. You have a, a, a victim. And let's say she's a victim of a uh, of a rape uh, from somebody she met in uh, met, met met through social media. We have a social media photograph, a good quality photograph of that individual, and uh, and run that. And if it's not already a previously known sex offender, we ought to be able to check, and we ought to be checking uh, the broader databases and, uh, for example, driver's license databases. And so I couldn't agree. Uh, more with with that suggestion, and I don't, you know, I don't, I don't. Um, uh, uh, otherwise, I didn't hear other other issues that you might want me to respond to. Hey, thanks, Steve. Jay, what's your perspective on this? And uh, go ahead, jump in. I mean, I think that um, the NIST report was quite clear. It found demographic differentials up to a hundred times more for African American and Asian people than white people. Um, it said that there was no algorithm that was found that didn't have demographic differentials. Uh, it found that um, women were more likely to be misidentified two to five times more often than men. Um, and more to the point, you know, it's easy to say, well, the best, the best algorithm is this and the best algorithm is that, and even the best ones were flawed. There are 18,000, give or take, police departments law enforcement agencies in this country. And how do we know that all of them are gonna adopt the best algorithms? Um, and Patrick Grother and other, his colleagues have expressed a lot of concern that you have to make sure that the algorithm that you get is a good one, but that's not the kind of thing that government agencies are necessarily good at. Um, evaluating tech like that is not a, you know, sort of the core competency of, of law enforcement. Um, not only that, but the uh, the NIST found that the differentials, as Dr. Phillips was saying, can vary widely depending on where you put your camera. Uh, how high is the contrast between the background and the subject? Um, and there are so many variables out there that it's easy to say, um, oh yeah, well in the best case scenario, we'll all do the best thing. But um, in the real world, um, the departments are going to be all over the map. Um, I think this, we know that. And even the best case scenario is not good enough. Thank you. Uh, one of the questions that came from the audience, Jay, was uh, whether or not the ACLU's call for a moratorium pertained just to law enforcement, or did it also pertain to the private sector's use, as you talked about being concerned about that as well? It pertained just to government, but we do think that um, the private sector should also slow down and not be um, uh, deploying um, face recognition until we have a lot more certainty about um, exactly you know, what the foibles of the technology are, the deployment best practices, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and as I said, these companies are uh, refusing to tell the public whether or not they're using face recognition. And that means that, I mean, if, if, if they think their customers don't care, then why aren't they willing to say that they're using it? If they think their customers do care, but want to use it anyway, uh, I guess I just call that unethical. Mm -hmm. uh, Jonathan, to back to you briefly, we've talked a little bit, several of the speakers have referenced the NIST research. Have any of us misunderstood or misinterpreted those findings? What's, your, what, what's the results? So I'll go back to um, what um, Steve Cook said when um, my, it was my, it's actually the a direct, I work for the Information Technology Lab at NIST and our director, Dr. Charles Romain, testified in, it was the reference he was talking to January 15th and I think it's important to note that when you're doing the one-to-many search the, the, the his statement that the out the out accuracy the different 
differential is very small. So this goes back to, do you judge the entire technology by the, the mean algorithm that submitted to NIST, or do you say, look at what it is for the, app, the algorithm, the application itself is out there. So I think that's the, the way to judge it and look at it, and also to look at it in the context of the problem, you're, the, the concerns, your, your problem you're solving, at what point it's operating, and, and how does it affect the outcomes? So, you know, there are many issues with it, but you need to go back and look at what you're doing. And if the, if the best algorithms are working very, very well for applications, then that needs to be noted. I would, would also um, just uh, say that the NIST study was based on portrait quality photos. And a lot of what law enforcement are using are gonna be, you know, security camera photos of varying quality and lighting, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not even clear that the NIST study applies to real world um, uses and, and the, the demographic differentials and as well as the overall accuracy questions could be much different than what um, was found with, with NIST. Although NIST did look at, 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 at one of their set, uh, data sets was border control pictures, which were slightly um, uh, under, under controlled. Um, so yeah. It, Jim, Don't, yes, Barry. If I can just jump in real quickly on this, I think it, I, I want to just say something about accuracy and the public-private divide and then regulation, which is everybody forgets that the quality of the video that you're going to get is well below what we're talking about with mug shots or portrait level photographs. Uh, these are glimpses of a, of, a, of a camera that are caught one way or another. And I'm on the Axon, on Axon's AI ethics board, and we recommended and Axon agreed not to put facial rec on body cams precisely because there are these disparities and these inaccuracies now, and we're just nowhere near close. And I, I talked to a lot of technologists about this, but we were nowhere near close to do that quality of video. I also think the public-private divide, I completely understand why the ACLU's done what it, what it has, which is a greater concern about government versus what private industry can do to you. But increasingly, because of the you know, the fluidity between the public and private spheres in terms of the ability to get data from one another. I do think we have to be concerned about both sides of that divide. And there's an answer. And this is the thing I want to stress, which is, you know, I'm not saying the policing project does not say do not use this technology, but we all ought to just pause and regulate it. And we ought to figure out what that regulation looks like and then get consensus that that's what we're going to do as a society. And what I really do regret is the sort of running around that and just going ahead because we haven't been able to figure these problems out. And, and you know, it's, it's one could point a finger at law enforcement, but one could point a figure at uh, legislative assemblies because they don't want to deal with this. And so I think we sort of have to force them to deal with it and come up to the table and say, this, these are going to be the rules of the road. Yeah, great, great conversation. One of the questions from the audience right now is uh, that's been kind of voted up to the top is, um, you know, why are we responding to this way to facial recognition technology, but we seem to be okay with the risks associated with other technologies in law enforcement? And I know Barry mentioned uh, ALPRs, but I think the question that, that we've received here really gets to eyewitness identification, DNA practices, fingerprint practices. I mean, there's potential risk in all of those uh, processes. Why is this so different? Barry, do you want to start? Sure, sure. I mean, I'm a one trick pony or maybe a two trick pony. So I, you know, first I think there ought to be democratic authorization for anything we do, whether it's DNA databases or fingerprints or uh, ALP, you know, license plate readers. We ought to have a consensus in, in society that this is what we're going to do. Then the regulation for each is not going to be precisely the same because the technologies are different. And so you have to say, what's the risk of a particularly uh, particular technology? What's the state of the science? What's the benefit, by the way? So the thing you ought to be able to articulate first is what are you going to get out of it that you maybe don't have already? So, you know, with DNA, one of the stories was we're going to use this for identification, but we already had fingerprints. The reason for DNA is cold cases. That's a different reason. So you got to figure out what's the use, and then you have to figure out what are the harms and regulate against them. And that will vary from technology to technology, though there are certainly some commonalities. And on our website, I posted the link we have an evaluative framework that we use to figure out, you know, sort of technology by technology, how to address this. Yeah, and, and just, um, yeah, go ahead, Jay. I would just add, you know, we, we do also care about um, problems with these other technologies. Um, it is true that face recognition is newer and so it's attracting more attention by everybody, but face recognition, the under, face recognition, unlike 
a lot of those other technologies, um, it, it has the potential to create injustices if it's you done wrong. But it also lurking behind that discussion is the fact that it is it is potentially, as I said, a nuclear bomb of privacy that if um, harnessed to you know camp large networks of cameras, et cetera, could really create a a sort of dystopian tracking society in the way that um, you know fingerprints probably cannot. Yeah, Sakira, you've talked a lot about um, your concern with other aspects of the criminal justice system and its implications. How do you see this issue? Why, why do we care so much more about facial recognition than we do other technologies? Well, I wanna say the leadership conference actually cares about all police technology. <laughs> we have several reports that we put out around body camera technology and its use and the vast um, inconsistencies in the policies that police departments have adopted as it relates to their deployment of body on cameras. We've done a study um, related to that and very early on you know we took a very hard line position about uh, the use of facial recognition with body cameras um, and so we've also uh, submitted and i was going to try to put all of these links in the chat we've also developed a set, set uh, excuse me a statement of principles around predictive policing um, tools um, and, and predictive analytics and and the concerns both civil rights and privacy concerns that we have with those tools so i don't want to um, I think this is just a, the next iteration and a long iteration of police technologies that um, you know our organization, our members, um, communities of color specifically have been concerned about the old, the high tech surveillance. In 2014, we put out a, a set of principles on big data, and the first principle was stop high tech surveillance, right? And 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 we were very concerned early on about the adoption of a um, new uh, technologies um, that could disproportionately impact communities of color, especially because of the historic relationships and the nature of policing and how policing happens in some communities um, and the over policing that often happens in some communities. And so for us, this is just one piece on a long continuum of technologies that are, are have the potential to be adopted by law enforcement and or used by law enforcement and a real lack of, I would say, transparency um, and consultation, as I think Paul noted early on, with the community. There is no, in many instances, there is there isn't any government oversight. You know, the the um, post, you know, many of the um, issues that happened in 2016, you know, there was this push for body-worn cameras. There was this push for, for swift adoption as a mechanism to improve community police relations, as a mechanism to, you know, sort of prove uh, or to have um, another data set when there were interactions that might have ended up improperly or in a way that people were concerned about. But there really wasn't a discussion about what are the rules of the road for that, right? <laughs> How should police departments deploy these? What are the policies and procedures with respect to data retention, with respect to access, with respect to, um, you know, when the camera should be on and off, like basic rules for the road. And we saw that early on, there was just a push for this to happen and the federal government funded it, but they really didn't fund it with any guidelines for how departments, 18,000 almost departments across the United States should implement it. And so we have seen the results of that is inconsistency in application, inconsistency in our view, and protections for uh, civil people's civil rights and civil liberties. Um, and I'm concerned that that is a model or that is an example of how this could be deployed and why we are sounding alarm bells and have been sounding alarm bells since 2016, uh, along with the ACLU and others, about the, the potential use, right? Even if we don't know whether or not people are using them, but the potential use and misuse of these types of texts. And I think Barry is right that if we can get to a place where accuracy, my, my concerns around accuracy and misidentification as an African-American woman and a person who has African-American uh, brothers um, who have, have had, you know, interesting interactions with law enforcement, if we can, even if we can get to that place, I think there, that there, this, this conversation around government oversight and safeguards is a critical one. And until that happens, until that is the first point for us to start, we definitely you know, have to put, pump the brakes on uses 
in a variety of contexts, even in the private mm -hmm. sector. The case that I mentioned, I want to clarify that I mentioned in New York in the public housing, it was the landlord who wanted to use the technology um, for seemingly uh, correct uh, use on, on its face, but actually he was trying to use it so that he could identify women in the building who were trying to organize other tenants. Mm -hmm. and, right? He, he was saying it was for one thing, but ultimately they uncovered that he didn't, he had nefarious purposes for his use. Um, and that he was trying to organize, he was trying to identify women who were organizing, um, you know, other tenants to, you know, sort of advocate for improved conditions in, in, in the housing, um, in the public housing facility. So um, there are too many unknowns, I think, um, and too many questions as Barry and, and, and Jay and even Paul, I think, have noted um, that, that it requires further discussion and, and research um, um, now instead of down the road, you know, sort of trying to backtrack and fix things after we've already um, set, uh, let things loose and people are um, governing themselves in a way that isn't, isn't right. Yeah, thank you. And uh, one of the things that Jonathan pointed out to me the other day is that uh, just how prevalent and accessible this is. And he's, I think your, your words, Jonathan, was that, you know, any sort of uh, advanced high school or early college student could go online and, and download this technology and begin using it, right? So, yeah, so my, so I may clarify. So if I want an algorithm to run experiments, I can then download it and run experiments mm -hmm. for say a course or a study thing or, um, 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 I, the other is my mind. Um, but the other work behind this is there's the face recognition part, which runs it. The other part, which may be hard, which would be much harder to do, would be the back end, the software engineering to create the databases and create a system that is operational. So, one level, if you want to run experiments with and investigate it with, you can download and use their algorithms, but to create the entire infrastructure to run it mm -hmm. probably takes a different level of skills or different set of skills to run. Yeah, thank you, Doctor. Steve Cook, um, we've heard a few times here that we need more regulation, more statutes in place to govern this. What's your take on that? Well, it's that, see, and, and I've watched a lot of the congressional hearings on it, and it seems to me that that the uh, law enforcement community has done an outstanding, the United States law enforcement community has done an exceptional job in, in uh, setting standards, following standards. BJA, for example, has a, has a, has a, uh, a pamphlet or a document that has uh, suggested policies. And the FBI has implemented a series of policies, all of which are designed to make sure that, uh, that, that, that constitutional rights are protected, that privacy rights are protected and right now it sounds like to me that this call for legislation is uh is really a solution in search of a problem i haven't heard this despite the the uh, uh collective experience of the panel i haven't heard any uh significant uh, certainly not statistically significant examples of gross abuses by law enforcement what we do have is a long list of uh successes in law enforcement successes in by TSA keeping us safer, by uh, custom border protection, uh, by protecting our borders, uh, keeping terrorists out, uh, putting murderers in prison, solving crimes that wouldn't otherwise be solved, recovering children uh, who are being trafficked, sex trafficked. All of these examples of good uses with uh, U.S. law enforcement uh, self-regulating and uh, in, in virtually no uh, examples of abuses. Thanks, Steve. And, and it's time for closing comments. Um, I'd like to go around and just give everybody literally about 15, 30 seconds to say if there's been anything that you've wanted to say here today that hasn't been able to come out. I think two things really strike me about this conversation. One is there's nobody here in this forum that said that we need a ban. Uh, everybody here has said that what we need is a moratorium and time to get our hands around this. Uh, the other thing that really struck me was um, this conversation about needing to have a more expansive database. And I'm, um, Jay, I want to turn to you first for closing remarks, because I'm surprised that you didn't object to that, uh, the more expansive database. I mean, it's a very difficult issue that Barry brought up there. And we 
you know, we're not at the point now where we're thinking about like, well, what does mass face recognition deployment look like? We're, we're calling for a moratorium and we're working towards that. So we're not interested in getting into discussions at this point about, you know, what, about those questions. Um, I guess just, uh, I don't know if I have any of my 30 seconds left, but um, <laughs> I guess I would just say that, um, you know, I disagree with uh, Steve Cook's take there, obviously. And um, I think that there have been abuses. I don't question that there have been successes. Uh, I know that, you know, law enforcement often touts the successes and like all organizations touts the successes and buries its failures um, and exactly what the proportions there are. Um, you, you, for any technology, you can come up with a scenario in which it saves the day. The question isn't, isn't, isn't that, it's how often is that scenario? How, how um, important is that scenario? And, and what are the side effects and what are the failures that we're not seeing? Um, so, um, you know, I think that these are all questions that we need to just hit a pause button. We, the human, human humanity has been around for, uh, you know, civilization has been around for a couple thousand years without face recognition. And I don't think we need to, I think we can take a few more years before, uh, get this right, um, before we rush into adopting it wholesale. Thank you, Jay. I appreciate you being here. Paul, you're next. You're on mute, Paul. Thanks for having me, Jim. Uh, I just, I'd just like to say, we got to find middle ground. We got to find balance. And the group you put together today clearly seemed reasonable. I think if you put everyone in a room together, um, solutions would come out of that if, if everyone keeps a reasonable head on. Great, thank you, Paul. Uh, Dr. Phillips. So I'd like to say I enjoyed being on the panel and listening to everybody's everybody's opinions and thoughts. Um, the one thing that came up a lot is the issue of um, demographic differentials. And from a researcher and people in the development, this is taken seriously. Um, it is now a major effort to address this and correct the problem in face recognition or mitigate as we like to say, don't say so. I'm looking that in a couple of years, if you did this again, the story would be, be substantially different. Thank you, sir. Secure. So I want to say thank you um, for inviting me to this important discussion. And I just want to, you know, reiterate uh, some of the things that we mentioned early on. And I think Paul is right that <clears throat> we might get to a place, and, and as Professor Phil, uh, Phillips said, we might get to a place where we can find common ground. But I think given the outstanding concerns around accuracy, oversight and accountability, transparency, and uh, access to sort of non-law enforcement beta databases um, and the serious concerns in the, in the private sector as well, you know, our position around a moratorium is, is, is solid. <laughs> and I think that this, there are too many questions that have to be answered um, before we can even get down the road to uh, what does mass look, what, is ma uh, what, is, what do safeguards and guardrails sort of look like, right? And so I would, caution all of us and, and, and invite us to have that discussion and, and, and an ongoing discussion and debate about that um, and try to figure out um, um, where, where, if any, <laughs> any place uh, we can land uh, collectively around the use of this technology. Thank you so much. Barry? Uh, thank you, Jim, and thanks to the Law Enforcement Museum. I think it's been a great panel and I've enjoyed listening to everyone. Uh, I do think there's a way forward, and I think we have to be sensible about that way forward, uh, have the right safeguards in place. Uh, you know, I, I do want to disagree with Steve about one thing that I think is important, which is I think that there's this tendency to, uh, to view regulation as uh, an obstacle, which of course it can be, but we disserve law enforcement and the role of public safety in this country by not getting ahead of things and deciding what the guardrails are going to look like. And so plenty of agencies don't use facial recognition as I think they ought not to because there's been no go ahead. Uh, and so I think what you need to do is figure out what are going to be the rules of the road and write them into law and then make sure there's adherence. That seems to be the democratically accountable and sane way to achieve public safety. Steve. Hey, Jim. Thank, thank you. Um, I just, you know, in closing, I just want to thank you for moderating and, uh, and of course, uh, your organization, the National Police Foundation, great organization doing great work for law enforcement and for the community. Also, of course, want to thank the uh, Law Enforcement Museum. Uh, the picture in the back had me fooled. I thought you were there. But it's, uh, it, it, if you ha if for anybody who hasn't been there, it's a great place to visit. I've had the privilege of being there a couple of times and, and really enjoyed 
uh, yet. So uh, that's really in closing. I just want to express my appreciation to, uh, to, to you and to the museum and the foundation. So thank you. Thanks so much, Steve. It's been my pleasure to, uh, to try to uh, moderate the conversation. You guys have been fantastic to work with. And uh, Marsha, I'm happy to turn it back over to you for closing. Sure. Thank you, Jim. And thank you to all the panelists. These are the kind of conversations, these are the, the kind of table that we plan on setting, not only today, but in the future at the museum and the memorial. And the, and the balance of this conversation, the hard discussions um, are important to have. And we uh, intend to continue to have those, those uh, discussions and hopefully they will all be moderated as well as Jim did today. So, so thank you, Jim. I'd also like to, uh, again, um, thank Target for sponsoring today's event. And in closing, I'd like to mention that although COVID-19 is putting a significant strain on our finance, financial resources, it is also reinforcing the critical importance of our mission. Uh, we are committed uh, more than ever to our fallen officers telling the story of law enforcement and making it safer for all those who serve. Uh, we hope you too will support the National Law Enforcement Memorial and Museum and light a candle for the thousands of officers who woke up this morning and who are sacrificing to keep our communities and our nation safe. And for those officers who have lost their lives in the line of duty, including those heroes um, uh, that have lost their lives uh, due to the coronavirus. You have the opportunity to light a candle, a virtual candle in their honor at lawmemorial.org forward slash UBL, that stands for United by Light. I'll repeat that address again. Uh, that's lawmemorial.org forward slash UBL. That concludes our program. Thank you for joining us. Stay safe and make it a great day. Thanks everyone.